Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire. Jeff, could you maybe laugh just a little bit less? Come on, man. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to vroom vroom veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. Tom Schwab. Thank you so much for being on my podcast and welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer. How's it going? Jeff, I am thrilled to be here. Yeah, this is going to be a blast. Uh, You were introduced to me by our mutual friend, Scott Beebe, who I had a a good time talking to. And that proves that not everybody in Michigan knows each other. Scott had to introduce (laughs) us. I'm not in Michigan anymore. I, I, but, I, I go back and visit, but I am from Michigan. I'm from the uh, Upper Peninsula, and you know where that is, and that's awesome. That's great. And you are currently in Kalamazoo. I am. And that's a college town, if I'm not wrong, right? It is. I mean, it uh, the population changes drastically throughout the year. Right. Uh, so when uh, Western Michigan University and Kalamazoo College is in town, uh, traffic gets really bad. And uh, the rest <laughs> of the year, uh, we, we cool. have a lot of fun getting around. Yeah, there you go. All right. So you know how we play this game on Vroom Vroom Veer. We talk about your life and how you struggled and then ultimately got to this cool place where you get to have your own website where it's tmschwab.com and you talk about inbound marketing and cool stuff and and how you help uh, uh, entrepreneurs and solopreneurs and business owners um, you know do their thing and and rethink their marketing using the internet which I think is fascinating but before all of that <laughs> way back when right you were you were like a struggling college student so where did you go to school I went to the United States Naval Academy in wow. Annapolis, Maryland. So my uh, experience and my college stories are a lot different than other people. No kidding. Uh, when, when they talked about, um, you know, their crazy parties and crazy things they were doing, uh, I can tell stories of being on watch and uh, and peeing in a cup every couple of weeks. <laughs> I know exactly what that's like. <laughs> I did it for 20 years. <laughs> oh, sheesh. Do you remember the first time you had to do that? Uh, I don't know if civilians know this, but I'm going to share a little bit. And this is an overshare, probably. <laughs> but um, And you know, so I'm not telling you anything. So this is for the audience, that uh, when you do a urinalysis test in the military, the, they have this person that goes with you. They're your observer. And they have to physically observe you putting the liquid into the cup. (laughs) The first time you do that, that's a little weird. And then you get used to it. It's no big deal. And the worst part is you don't remember the first time that you do it as much as you remember the first time you have to be the observer. Yes. And you have to stand there and watch everybody knowing that out of passive aggressive, they're going to hit all over the cup too and hand it to you. (laughs) So that is my college stories. Let me tell you, uh, I I got really chatty. That's because, you know, it seemed like I was trying to put people at ease because people that were like nervous to go, you know, take a pee in, in front of somebody else, they would waste time, you know, and they would be there. And, you know, I had to finish everybody before I would get done with observer duty. So, yeah, I was trying to be, you know, make them relax and get the deed done. <laughs> And for me, it was, I I make fun of it there, but it was a great experience because I I grew up in the Midwest in the suburbs of Chicago and my world uh, stretched all the way from the Mississippi River to St. Joseph, Michigan. So the world was really small and it was great. You know, at 17, I joined the Navy, um, went to the Naval Academy. And by the next year I came back, I'd been around the world, Australia, um, got to see so many neat things and be exposed to people that... um, were different or at least didn't grow up in the same area that I did. And it was just a great way to, to be exposed to new ideas and, and see all that the world has to offer. Right, right. So did they throw you in the water when you uh, crossed the uh, equator? 
I'll, uh, they sure did. And I swam <laughs> through the, the dead fishes. I, I'm a shell back. So, uh, I did that. And, and that was, that was a whole lot of fun, great stories. And, yeah. uh, yeah, uh, yeah. it's a great tradition that, uh, that hangs on in the Navy. Yeah. That, it's, that's a fun one. I know, um, one of the traditions that when I worked when, uh, with, uh, I was an admin troop and on the enlisted side. Uh, and so that meant that I got to work with all different sorts of specialties and, for a short period, uh, about four years, I worked with air, aircraft maintenance dudes in Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida and Panama City. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. One of their traditions was when you were the new guy, uh, during one of their first, they had a, a monthly barbecue uh, at this little uh, on-base beach park, and they would throw you in the water when you were the new guy. It's just like new guy initiation. Real easy. Nothing, you know, nothing major, <laughs> right? But I saw like... I saw like a couple of new newer guys than me. They were be- backlogged of new guys, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I got I, they didn't throw me in right away. So I saw like a good example of what to do when this is going to happen, and a bad example of what to do when this is going to happen. So one guy put on a big show and fought really hard to get thrown in the water, but eventually he was thrown in the water, and it was a lot of fun, right? And then another guy was like, "Okay, whatever, just I'll, I'll walk in." Okay. Yeah. All right. Now I'm, now I'm wet. Yippee skippy. Right. I was like, boo. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> because wanted... with that, with that, you just define your, your next few years there on what people will think of you. Yeah. Well, just not fun. Right. So <laughs> when it was my turn and I knew it was my day, I, I kind of hung out really close to like this uh, beam on the uh, little pavilion. So my plan was I was going to get a death hold grip on that beam, you know, and I, I kept an unopened Coke in my hand, right? <laughs> and as they started making their move, I shook that sucker up and opened it up and started spraying everybody with it. <laughs> You're going to get me, but I'm going to get you exactly. too. Exactly. And then I, and then I got the death grip on, oh man, it, it was like nearly like 10, 15 minutes of, of very good struggling before I, I, I finally got thrown in the water and it took a lot of people in and got a lot of people wet with me <laughs> it was awesome and through all of that it's like you gotta have fun you at gotta those, have fun, fun with things yeah exactly okay so so how long did you end up staying in the navy sure i did four years at the academy and then did uh, five years active duty afterwards that's awesome and it was it was a great time you know i um it was at the end of the reagan build-up so, you know, it was a great time to be in the military, a lot of fun things going on there. Um, and my first job out of college, I always say, was running a nuclear power plant. That's, that's so, the best. <laughs> well, I've, I've, and I always say I've run a nuclear power plant and I've run a small business. And one of them is easy because they give you a manual with it. Right. The other one, you got to figure out yourself. But right. it was it was a, amazing when you look at what the military does. And you saw the same thing that you could take somebody, you know, that was bright, motivated out of high school and teach them a skill within a couple of years. You know, the dirty secret that uh, probably nobody wants to think about, but the average age of somebody in the military that's running a nuclear reactor is about 22 or 23. I know. Scary when you think about it, but true. It is. I know. but they've got systems that they've put in place mm. and they've trained on them and, and yeah. made people um, proficient in it yeah. so that for, what, 60 years they've been doing that safely. And yeah. you can look at all kinds of different things of, you know, taking, uh, you know, uh, repairing aircraft, uh, air traffic controllers. Uh, you know, in the military, uh, they're a whole lot younger than they are in civilian life, but they still do a great job. And I think it taught me that you, if you break anything down into a system mm. and make it teachable and make it reproducible, mm-hmm. that's how you can have success. Amen. You know, not not that we didn't have mistakes there, but we never made a mistake more than once. If you made a mistake, everybody you'd share with it on what happened so that it never happens again. And uh, that that just amazed me there. And when I came out in the civilian world and found out that it was so different. So that's yeah, one of the is. things that I've always, I pulled away from that and said, you know, um, you can build systems, you can systematize things uh, to make businesses run and, and, and make it so that you don't have to be superhuman uh, to do it. 
Yeah, while we're in the military, we kind of like poo-poo the training. I, I know I did. <laughs> <laughs> Until I got out, you know, and uh, and I saw how willy nilly kind of the the civilian world is. It's like they just assume you know what to do almost, you know, and they're they might like say, OK, today's your training. And that means you're going to walk around with this guy and he's going to do the job while you watch. And then the next day it's your job to know what he did. <laughs> That's kind of like what some companies and government, you know, cities, whatever. That's what they consider training. And looking back Crazy. in the military, you know, if you if you had somebody that messed up under your under your command or that you were in charge of, yeah. the answer was always, "How come you didn't train him well enough?" That's true. Uh, That's right. And uh, and you had to sign off on the fact that he knew what what he had been trained. Exactly. And I yeah. I look at this even now as a, as an entrepreneur. When I when somebody doesn't work out, I look at it and say it's not it's not that they were crazy or even like you get a customer. It's not that the customers crazy or a bad fit. It's like, okay, what did you do to attract them? Um, why didn't you train them right? Why didn't you set it up well? And you know, not everybody's going to work out for your company. There is a an employee or is a client. But for God's sake, don't keep doing the same mistake over and over. Amen. And uh, you know, that's yeah. what I learned early on in life and thought, wow, that that makes a whole lot the world a whole lot easier afterwards. It's so true. Yeah, you know, um when the thing you were talking about how the military does a better job or a really good job of training and that that allows them to let those you know relatively irresponsible and inexperienced folks do some really important stuff um the system you know and i i can't think that the the air force is too different than the than the navy uh the navy's crazy i mean the, when i see like training for the Navy, how seriously they take it. I get it because it's so life and death on a boat, you know, or a sub, you know, um, that, that makes sense. You know, I was it. So, you know, my training was a lot less life and deathy, you know, you know, I can see maybe some is, but, um, the, the point I was getting at is there's always like this threshold with training. Like I was talking to an instructor pilot. He was, a, uh, he was a pilot, for the MC-135, it's the uh, the version of the C-135 that the Special Forces the, guys use to fly okay. really low and drop the, the armed killers into, <laughs> <laughs> into the bad place, right? <laughs> so, he, and he was a pilot trainer, and he was like, you know, I could train a monkey to fly if I had enough time, right? But there's thresholds. You know, we don't want somebody that takes too long. So if you haven't gotten it by, you know, phase one, um, then you can go get another job because this isn't the job for you. And through, you know, iterations of that training program, that's what works best. If that makes sense. Most definitely. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on because we're geeking out on military stuff too much. So, okay, so you spend your time in the military and then had you gotten married on along the way and had and well, had kids and stuff i i had uh, gotten married okay um i had two kids while at in that first 5 years and you know my my son um i was there for the conception i wasn't there for the birth right you know Typical if you got to pick stuff. if you got to pick one pick that yeah. um and, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, with that, you know, I, I figured that, hey, this is going to be a career, right? you know, for the next 20 years. Sure. And while we were in the Gulf, uh, the arch enemy, you know, the Soviet Union pretty much dissolved. I remember uh, that. Yeah. We came out of there and, you know, usually aircraft carriers are, are were trailed by a Russian trawler all the time mm -hmm. just to keep an eye on us. We came out of the Gulf and they were nowhere to be found. And we were scared that something happened to them. And it <laughs> hey, did. Hey, where did our buddies they, go? Right. Yeah. The, yeah did they sink? Their enemy. Where'd they go? No, they, they ran out of money. I know. And, you know, you talk about losing your enemy, but that was, that was a, uh, a real thing because, yeah. you know, we're seeing it now where the military is shrinking. You think you've got this great stable job and all of a sudden things change and right. it's, due to no fault of your own. But I looked at it and I thought, wow, I've I've done some amazing and fun things here. On the way back, I got to do a job that I would have done three years when I came back. And I looked at that and I said, well, 
you know, for the next 15 years, I'm going to be on the sort of the same type of ship um, during all the military cutbacks. And, you know, I, I had the experience I wanted. I had fun. Uh, it was definitely a, a challenge on the family at that point. Sure. And my hat's off to, to military families because uh, I tough. always say the service members have it easy. They it's the do. people that they leave behind right. that are the challenges. So I looked at that and thought, okay, well, you know, I'll go from one stable industry and I'll go into another one and I'll, I'll uh, you know, use my skills in a, a Fortune 500 company. And uh, so that's when I made the transition transition in 1992 um, out of the military. And that's what got me to Kalamazoo. I, I came here on a snowy February day uh, <laughs> to take a job with a, a local company here. And I said, well, I'll take the job here, but I, I don't want to die here. Amen. And I still don't want to die here. But, you know, it's now 20 some years later and uh, my family's there. My family's grown up here. It's gotten to be home, and uh, uh, it's it's a wonderful place to live. But uh, I can also connect with anybody now through the internet. So that that makes Kalamazoo a lot less remote. Amen. So who did you start working with, and what were you doing in your first job out of the Navy? Sure, I went to work with Stryker. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a medical device manufacturer. And my first job out of the Navy, you know, I'm an engineer, so they put me in engineering. Makes <laughs> I've, yeah, makes I've, sense. yeah. It makes sense, but I realized I really don't like engineering that much. Sure. Um, I, I don't like sitting there at a, uh, a computer designing stuff. I want to get out and do more of the operations, and that's what I loved in the Navy. Uh, so quickly, I went from engineering uh, to production management to operations uh, and distribution. Okay. But after 18 months there, I started to look around and thought, you know, if you don't live within – probably 50 yards of my house, if you don't work in the same uh, building that I do, or if you don't sit a couple rows ahead of me or behind me in church, I don't know you. Right. And it, I just right. felt, I felt like I was on a submarine mm -hmm. as far as how confined it was. Mm -hmm. And I saw yeah. the salesmen out there that were going into uh, to new accounts every day and driving from place to place. And I had traveled with some of them. And uh, I thought, man, this looks like a great lifestyle. That I, I love like more fun. Huh? Oh, it's, it's more fun. And I, I love this. And uh, so, of course, you know, uh, it wasn't the usual model. So Stryker at that point said, no, we don't have people go from the inside to the outside. And I had a great career on the inside, and uh, my dad told me that I was crazy when I left, but I'm just like, once again, I can't just, like the military, I can't just put in another 15 years to retire. I can't just put another you know, 20 years uh, sitting inside a building and retiring if that's not what I want. Yeah, you so had I that, went out. that cube itch, huh? <laughs> yes. Well, at the, I later found out it was like entrepreneurialism sure. uh, and uh, trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. But I went out and sold for a competitor for about 18 months and took oh, a territory okay. from nothing um, – to a large territory and it was all of Western Michigan. And that caused Stryker to look and say, wow, I guess the guy can sell. Right. Uh, so they brought me back and I was selling oh. uh, orthopedic implants, the shoulders, the knees, the hips, uh, a lot of trauma gear. So it was a fun time. And, and I loved that job and the people that I met and the experiences that I had. Very cool. So, okay. So now flash forward. So, okay. How long did you end up working with Stryker? Sure. I was with them uh, selling for about uh, five years. Okay. And then, you know, uh, with everything, if you're good at it, you get promoted. Yeah. So from there, I went from sales to sales management. And uh, I enjoyed that and um, was building up a team. And actually, one of the uh, uh, guys I used to work with uh, went to a competitor and a small company called Wright Medical out of uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And, you know, a lot of ex striker guys there. And okay. had the opportunity to have my own distributorship at that point. And, you know, you it was out, some, right? uh, it, most definitely. <laughs> so I took that, took the state of Michigan and uh, was doing that for about four years, building it up once again from not much to, to a great organization. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. You know, once again, I could see, okay, this is my trajectory. This is my path for the next, you know, decade or two decades. And I'm thinking you got bored. Uh, <laughs> or no, something, actually, something happened. Act, 
Actually, the Great Recession hit before I could get bored. Oh, gotcha. So, you know, all of a sudden, uh, the uh, 2008, 2009 hits, and the manufacturers started to look at it and say, um, you know, we could cut out the middleman, which always makes sense until you look in the mirror and you realize, wow, That's I, look like, <laughs> I look like the middleman. <laughs> right. And so they... So they wanted to to go direct. So um, they came back and said, you can either, you know, sell the distributorship back or we'll take it back when you miss quota next year. And I said, well, what's that, quota? That was and some, a when, some friend, when. <laughs> yeah. Some friends told me, you don't even want to know what quota is. It will be so high that they'll take it back. So at that point, it was it was interesting because, OK, we're just going into the recession, sold back the distributorship. And, you know, not that I needed to do something financially, but I, I needed to do something for myself. You know, I, retirement will, would kill me. Right, so right. Uh, with that, we had a small sideline product and it was helping people that couldn't bear weight and couldn't bear crutches. Uh, we called it good by crutches. And it was just it, it, really a regional player in, in Michigan here. Mm -hmm. But we were helping a lot of people. And the thing that struck me is that, you know, 15 years in orthopedics, I could count the number of thank you notes I got on one hand. Okay. But with these, we would send them out as rental units and they'd come back and half of them would come back with thank you notes. Wow. And on tough days, I, you know, when I was out, you know, selling orthopedic implants, I would call the office and say, could you save the thank you notes for me? And I'd read through those and yeah. It made a difference. And I, you know, I, I remember um, I had gone to Dave Ramsey's Entree Leadership and he talked about business being a ministry. And I never mm -hmm. saw that in a Fortune 500 company. It was always, you know, a sales quota and what have you done for me lately. Right. But with this company, for the first time in my life, I really thought I'm making a difference. I'm helping people and I'm being rewarded for it. So That's at amazing. that point, we, we looked at it and said, hey, could we take what we're doing here in Michigan and expand this out nationally? And so that sort of started that next phase of my life, which is really where I think I had the most growth and the most fun, which led me up to where I am today. Wow. Okay. So you talked about the growth, but usually there's a little bit of struggle to go along with growth. I'm sure you had some struggles along the way. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's, there's always struggles. And yeah. I, I, I think one of the, the things that I struggled with, uh, but also had fun with is that you never know everything you need to know to get to your, to where you're going. So true. But if you knew it, you'd already be there. Amen. That's true. <laughs> so good. Point. Uh, you know, uh, I, I always said, you know, um, you just take one step and have the faith that, you know, that step is going to be illuminated and that the right people are going to come in and, you know, keep moving, moving forward in faith. And, uh, I was just amazed by it. And, um, the things that I learned, I learned more in that first, probably four years running an online company and trying to expand a company from a regional one to a national one. I learned more in that time period that I think I've ever learned in my life. And that includes college, that includes nuclear power. Um, and one of the great things is that, you know, today, if you're ignorant, it's ignorance by choice. Right. There's so many, so much information out there um, that's freely available, people uh, to reach out to, um, that it was just like, uh, I love learning. And it was like a feeding frenzy right. of being able to learn something and then implement it, um, tweak it, put a system behind it and just keep, keep going on there. And once again, going back to the, everything I learned as an engineer was that, you know, build a system and then keep tuning it based on the feedback you get. And I love that because, uh, you know, with nowadays, especially with on the online version, um, people are always giving you feedback. They'll tell you what they love and what they loathe. And you just nice. have to be smart enough to know right answer when told. <laughs> when they say they love something, give them more of it. When they say they loathe it, stop, stop doing it. Doing it takes, yeah. it takes them off. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, wow. Okay. So l talk a little bit about this, this, what you're doing now and, and sure. how you got there. Yeah. Well, really what I'm doing now is, is inbound marketing. Okay. And I don't inbound, know what that is. <laughs> it's a buzz term. Okay. Yeah. 
it makes it, we get to charge a lot if we, if you don't know what the term is, That's right? That's good, right? <laughs> yeah. So when you, when you say marketing, everybody just sort of shudders because it's like, oh no, you know, most here, people here think. Those, here those guys come then they're going to try to sell me something I don't want, right? Yeah. Seth yeah. Godin said one time, marketers mess up everything. And uh, Gary Vaynerchuk changed that to marketers F up everything. But right. um, it both, both statements are true. Okay. And with that, you know, most people think of marketing as interruptions. You know, Jeff, I've got something that I want to sell Let you. Let me tell you about this. Yes, yeah. I've got something to sell you, and I'm going to interrupt your favorite TV show, um, song. Uh, on your way to work, I'm going to put up a really ugly billboard mm -hmm. just so I can sell something to you. Right. And what really changed my life was as we were building this company from a, a regional player to a national leader, um, I had read a book by two smart guys out of MIT, and they said the world had changed, that nobody ever liked to be sold. But people always like to buy and to solve their problems. So true. And their and their their premises or hypothesis was that the people that would win long term would be the people that helped people make better buying decisions by answering their questions. So that people go on to Google not to be sold to, but they go there to solve their problems. Right. And so those people that solve the problems with blogs, infographics, helpful social media posts, even content like this, those people would gain the know, like, and trust. They'd get the respect. Not only would they get the initial transaction, but they'd get the lifetime value too. Right. And so that's what we did building up our, our business. And, you know, eight years ago, blogs were the big thing and you could build up your business with blogs. And since then, they've got really saturated. You know, you ask people, nobody's really reading a whole lot of blogs it's and tough. we had, yeah, it's just yeah. hard to keep up with. And, and I you know, it. there's, I get it. <laughs> and, and, but, but the thing is, is that you give people content and answers in whatever way they want. So okay. if your customer, right, if your right. customers are watching videos, then put out videos, you know, if they're reading, put out blogs, but we worked with a client and uh, he was just a, he had a great voice. He sounded like Zig Ziglar. Mm. And uh, he had great stories and everything, but his blogs converted like everybody else's. You know, a typical blog will convert anywhere from one to two percent. Okay. And we thought, man, not could great. we get him? <laughs> yeah, not not great, but hey, it, it's, it's it's something. It's something. Mm -hmm. And we thought, man, could we get him on podcasts and get him interviewed because he didn't want to start his own podcast? And our thought was, is could we get in, him in front of established listeners? You know, people that already um, would be interested in what he's talking about. Right. And could we get him there for 30 minutes to, you know, to talk and educate them and build that no like, and trust? And we were blown away. I mean, the traffic was instantaneous. Um, it was quite a bit. And it also converted Better anywhere from 20. Yeah. And, and it converted like 25 to 50 percent. So wow. 25 times better than a blog. You know, if somebody hears you on a podcast, they get to know, like, and trust you. And if they don't, then that's fine. They can move on to somebody else. But right. if they're the kind of customer that is drawn to you, man, they come to your website ready to engage. So we went and tested that with other clients and found out similar results because we wondered if it's, is it just this guy? Is it just is he how a unicorn he talks? Kind of thing? Exactly. <laughs> right, right. Is it, is it the system or is it the unicorn? And what we found is that no, it's the system that the best way to get your message out there is talking to people. And really it, you know, if you look at it, marketing at its core is starting a discussion with somebody that could be an ideal client. Mm, okay. And there's no better way to do that than getting on podcasts, you know, talking about who you are, what you do. And if people are drawn to that, that's great. Those could be ideal customers. And it's a, it's a powerful way. You know, I always talk to people and say, you know, if I could get you in front of a hundred ideal customers, would you drive across town? And they're like, yes. Well, would you jump on a plane if I could get in front of a thousand? They're like, sure. I'm like, well, what if it was 10,000? Would you, you know, fly across the country? And they're like, no, I wouldn't talk in front of 10,000. That'd, that'd be too scary. And I'm like, well, you can talk to 10,000 from your home. You don't have to go anyplace and it's not scary. You know, you're talking to a, to a guy or a gal um, over a, a phone or a microphone. 
So it's just such a powerful, powerful tool uh, that you can use to connect with uh, ideal customers. Wow. So a big part of your whole strategy was podcasts. That's what we have gone to exclusively now. Really? Uh, you know, wow. As far as, exa- as far as the content that we focus on now with ourselves and with all of our clients is just getting on podcasts. That's amazing. Uh, it's, it's a That's great, good for me. <laughs> but it, it, yeah. it is. It's a win-win even, situation. Yeah. And we've even had podcasters um, that uh, we've worked with. And you look at, you know, some of the different podcasters that are looking to get more podcast listeners. It's like, well, where would you find more people to listen to your podcast? Well, 80% of the U.S. doesn't listen to, to podcasts. Not yet. So chances are going to, yeah, going to Facebook or Twitter – most of them don't listen. So if you want to find people that listen to podcasts, a good place to to find them would be listening to podcasts. Podcasts. That's true. And so it's a great way to get in front of it. And uh, especially now with podcasts, they're not saturated, you know, so it's not like you're not stealing somebody else's listener. No, if anything, the, the host gets credit for introducing you. You get credit. I mean, we've done it. We've worked with authors. We've worked with speakers. Uh, we've worked with a, a company that was doing uh, crowdfunding mm-hmm. and they wanted to get uh, their message out. So we got them on 15 podcasts and they all launched within a few days of the first few days of their crowdfunding. Wow. So they got this massive uptick of um publicity. Uh, they got this momentum going that held them through the entire thing. Uh, other things we've like uh, virtual book tours, we call them where somebody has got a new book out and they can go out there and, you know, get on a number of podcasts and it, uh, it beats going to Barnes and Nobles at uh, every little place and speaking to 10 people. So my question that jumps to mind is, is this what, are these, uh, are the listeners converting directly are they going, okay, I heard this guy on, you know, my favorite podcast, and then I went right to his site and signed up for his newsletter or whatever the the conversion is. Is that is that how it's happening or is it is it happening over time through Google? Well, it's both. A little bit of both, okay. Both, because if you look at it, you know, there's some people that right now are jogging. And I could put out my website address right now and they wouldn't remember it. Right, they wouldn't go there. Right, right. But – they may go back to the show notes right. and find the link there. Yeah. They may listen to it on their computer later and find the link there. They may just remember it and come to it. So right. as you look at the traffic, some of it comes through um, referral traffic from the host. Other is direct traffic. So they, they never remember, but the guy's name was Tom Schwab, and he was from Kalamazoo. Tom well, Schwab podcast, and then find the one you want. That's and there's only, yeah, there's yeah. only one Tom Schwab in Kalamazoo. So if oh, you just you search go. that, you're going to find it. And yeah, the yeah. same way, you know, uh, everybody's linking back and forth. I'm sure when you put the show notes up, there'll be links back to different sites. And so there's a way that you can, you can find that. And um, so it's very powerful from that. Yeah. And then, then it's also the repetition of, of, of it being evergreen, that people can listen to it. You know, some people will, will, will listen to this the day it posts because they can't wait for the next episode to come out. Right. But there's somebody right now, it's 2020. They're listening to the podcast for the first time. They're going back and listening to the archives and they're thinking, Jeff is great. (laughs) So to them, that's new content. So uh, it's, it's been amazing. um, The the traffic that we get from it. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's, that's fun. So, so now Talk a little bit about like how the growth sort of like spread. Was it like like really quick or did you did you grow like start in Michigan, work the Midwest? How did it work out? Because you know, there's a, no roadmap for that, right? Right. I'm a big, big fan of of testing everything. Okay. Um, in the back in the military days, uh, if you do you remember the big battleships? Uh, of course. Well, they, they're since decommissioned, but they had computers that would figure out everything. You know, the curvature of the earth, the humidity, you know, where wow. the target was going to move while the shell was in the air. Wow. They were so long. And they would do all these calculations. And at the end of the day, they couldn't get that close, you know, maybe within a few hundred yards, but that wasn't close enough. Wow. So what they would do is they'd, they'd do all their calculations and then they'd throw a shell out there. 
and the shell could go 10 miles, but they needed a forward observer or spotter Fire for to effect, say, sort of thing. yes, well, yeah. and, but they would look and say, no, it's a little bit too far left. They'd adjust it. And once they had it dialed adjusted, in. Yeah. dialed in, then they would unload all the guns and fire for effect. And so that's what I've always done in businesses. So for that first so fire, aim, fire. Exactly. <laughs> and then once and once you get it on there, fire, fire, fire. Fire, and fire, so that's, fire. <laughs> that's what we did for like the first six months. We tested everything. Um, you know, do you send them to your homepage? Do you send them to a special page? You know, do you offer them something? All those little things. And we, you know, do you do you promote the podcast? How do you promote the podcast? How do you even Find the shows that convert because not all of them will. Um, how do you get people to go from being listeners to visitors? All of those things we kept testing and found out what worked. And once we got it so that it was a provable system, that's when we really ramped it up. And we ramped it up so much so that um, I wrote a book on it that's coming out uh, in the spring of 2016. Uh, there's an online course, and we've even got a done-for-you service now. But, you know, little little things that we tested, and, and some of them came by total accident. Uh, we had one client. Those are always she, the funnest. <laughs> yeah, the most we fun, one, the funnest. Oh yeah, and <laughs> and the ones that are like, oh, I wish I would have thought that, thought about that. But we had a client, and she made um, uh, quilts. You know, she would cut up uh, jerseys or baby, or you know, she would cut up different shirts, and she'd make a quilt out of okay. them. Okay. And you know, how can you get somebody to go from being a listener to visit your site? And she had it perfect. They had made a quilt for Wayne Gretzky. And if she was on a sports podcast, she'd say, you know, if you want to see the quilt we made for Wayne Gretzky, just come back to the site. And she'd give the address and the, the pages she wanted to go to you. And what red-blooded man wouldn't want to see Wayne Gretzky's quilt? And so it would drive him there. Yeah. And then there's other ones that, uh, you know, if she was on a podcast with, with young moms, she would talk about how they made the cutest little quilt out of the baby clothes and they cut it all up and this this mother wanted to save it and give it to her daughter uh, when she had a child. Mm. And if you want to see what the quilt looks like, just come back to my site. Well, all these people have tears in their eyes and they're going back to her site to see what this quilt looks like. So with that, it's like, oh, okay. That taught us that you need to give people a reason to come back to the site. So you know, I'll I'll show, you know, uh, uh, a behind the curtain example here. If you want to uh, find, you know, nine tips, nine secrets that we've learned on how to get on a podcast, just come back to TM Schwab forward slash Vroom, and it's there. Hey. So there's a there's a reason <laughs> to go from being a listener to being a visitor. And if and if you didn't catch that, which I'm sure you didn't, you just go back to the show notes, right? And or and or. There. Follow on social media and it'll be there and there'll be other reasons to get back there. Yeah. And now for 90% of the audience, they're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And they won't take action on it. But there's probably that 10% are like, that is cool. I want to know how that. to do that. Right, right. And those are our ideal you know, customers that we would love to work with. And it sounds like it's got a little of resistance because I banged my head against the wall uh, while everybody was trying to do blogs cause for – I don't even know how many, too many websites in too many years to the point where, you know, I just decided that I'm don't enjoy intrinsically writing enough to want to do that. Uh, and it seemed a little saturated. Um, but the other thing that bothered me about that kind of business model was that every time Google changed their algorithm, you had to go and change every damn web page. I was yep. like, I'm not playing that game. <laughs> No way. I'll just go get a job if that's the game. I don't want to do that. So and it seems like this podcasting strategy kind of circumvents it. That's what kind of like why I was asking because it's the, that the Google stuff, if you try to chase it, um, you're not, you're not going to win. I don't think it's, it's, it, it's focusing on who's your customer. Yeah. Are you, is your customer Google and you're trying to make no. the, the no. Google search gods happy? No. <laughs> or is your customer the person that you want to talk to? Yeah. Um, and that's who you want to make happy. And, you know, one of the things that we saw is podcasting is just growing. You know, right now there's over 200,000 podcasts. Um, there's You can download it right on some cars. So really it's getting to be more like on-demand radio. Right. It is getting to the point where it'll be streaming pretty much anywhere all the time. 
Right. And people say, well, just start your own podcast. Well, I'm lazy. And <laughs> anybody that says that doing a podcast is easy. Yeah, it's not. Has either never done a podcast or never done it well. Right. You know, um, Jeff, you're going to spend, you know, you spent hours getting ready for it, finding the guests, doing the preparation work. We record here. I leave and go on my way after, you know, a 45 yep. minute conversation. I've got hours of work to do. <laughs> you've yeah, you've got hours of and I've editing, gotten it really promotion. Good down. Yeah. I've gotten it down and it's still hours. Yeah, I know. And so with that, being a guest, you it's can easy. get more. Yeah. It's easy. You can get more benefit right. because it's, I almost feel guilty about it. I it's love like, being so, a guest on other people, other podcasters, podcasts. That's the best. Because <laughs> all you do is show up and talk and have a good time. And then you go have a drink or whatever you want to do. <laughs> And Alex Harris, who is from, uh, he does a podcast called Marketing Optimization. And he was the one that told me, he's like, he never got a client from his own podcast. He only got clients from going on other people's podcasts. Uh, and his analogy right, was, right. it's like, you're not going to get converts in your own church. You know, everybody there knows you. Um, and if they would have bought from you, they would have done it six months ago. Right. He says, it's not until you go into a new audience that people are like, oh, oh wow, no. I want to work with him. Yeah. So from that strategy, um, I think there's more power uh, from a conversion standpoint of, of getting in front of a fresh audience as a podcast guest. And, you know, the scalability is amazing because, uh, you know, uh, podcasts are typically anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. Right. Uh, so it's very easy to do, you know, a podcast interview a day. It's very hard to produce your own podcast once a day. Yeah, there's a lot more work having the podcast. I'm with you on that. Being a podcast guest, pretty darn easy. And I've noticed, too, um, as I'm, you know, looking for bookings, it's getting easier, you know, it, to book guests. Um, especially when, you know, my first couple podcasts were a little bit different focus. But as long as you are talking to, to somebody that has something a message right they don't just want to yammer on you know i think the the entertainment style podcast where you, it's just comedians and celebrities that works that model where you just talk you know um but for the rest of us you know we're not famous we have to actually have something to say that people want to listen to and that's one of the things that yeah. we figured out in our testing because it's it's relatively easy to get on a podcast Right. You know, there's there's 200,000 out there. You can get on one of them. You can get on but, a lot of them. <laughs> but but it doesn't mean that they'll do you any good. Right. Okay. Because if they don't have your listeners on there, um, right. you know, it's sense. not going to do any any business good. Um, if they if they don't publish regularly, it's not going to do you a lot of good. If they don't have show notes that can give you that SEO value and right. a way for people to get back to you, it's not going to do you a lot of good. And then ultimately, it's not only finding the right podcast, but then getting on there and finding a way to to work it so that you can turn the listeners into visitors and visitors into leads. Uh, I always look at it as the the interview is like the fuel. You know, the content is fuel. Right. But what engine are you going to put it into? And so that's one of the things that that we help our clients with, and really make it a marketing strategy out of it. We got a a uh, a coach that has built his entire business over the last eighteen months by being a podcast guest. He was one of our um, our, our big trial um, uh, trial cases, and it's just been a great case study on how you can reach an audience. And really, like he says, he went from being obscure to acclaimed in under a year wow. and the relationships that he's made with podcasters and the people that have heard him, uh, he's built his entire business, uh, just on the strategy of being a podcast guest. Well, it sounds to me like I learned something today. I need to be on other podcasts. <laughs> what do you think? Very much so. And as yeah. a um, as a podcaster, you already have the equipment, you've already got the yeah. know-how right. and as you go on other people's podcasts, uh, they'll go on yours and right. people always say, you know, well, it's how do I get on a win -win podcast? Thing. Yeah. Right. And it's, uh, the, the hardest part is starting. Right. Once you get on a few podcasts and get comfortable with it, uh, the podcast community is very intertwined. Yeah. 
So, Jeff, you probably know 10 other podcasters. Right. So at the end of this- way more than 10 other podcasters. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> right. So, you know, I could ask, hey, do you think I'd be a good guest on any other shows? Boom. There's the introduction. Right. You know, a friend of mine, it was Scott Beebe we mentioned at the beginning. He was the one that gave you my name after, you know, you he had been on uh, your show. Right. So it's that- helping each other out. So uh, really, it's it's a very, very scalable, scalable strategy. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun, too. I could talk for, you know, it, I when I first did my, I, I should say, when I did my last podcast, I had a more flexible job. I was driving for Lyft. Um, so I could drive whenever I wanted to. And okay. that, that was just for shoe money, you know, keeping mama happy. Um so I was like doing like three, four, five podcasts in a day, you know, <laughs> and then driving at night and, and whenever I could kind of in between the podcast. So I was like way ahead of the curve. I was like months and months, you know, recorded, you know, it was like I had shows like and I and I committed to staying only weekly. But now that I have a job. Uh, I, you know, I'm working in, uh, um, it at Inglewood school district. So I'm working six hours a day and I can only really, you know, shave off like three or four hours a couple times a week, you know, to, uh, to, to dedicate to recording the podcast. So that means, uh, I'm having a little bit of harder time keeping up with the weekly schedule. So I need, and, yeah, go ahead. And, and you're so glad that during those boom times, you didn't go to a daily show and oh have to goodness. keep that going. I, but I've yeah, seen we, so many people go that route because of John Lee Dumas saying, I can do I can do a daily show. And I'm like, you can do a daily show, but that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know. I, I don't I think, you know, me every day might be too much. <laughs> and for a lot of our clients, just they look at that and say, I see the power of podcasting, yeah. but I don't have the three or four hours a week to, or, you know, six or eight to dedicate to doing a podcast. Right. And so but even if you do everything week. yourself as a guest, you know, you can do that. Or we've even, you know, uh, gotten a, a done for you concierge level service called Interview Valet, where if people, all they want to do is show up and speak. They want somebody else to find the right podcast, do the bookings, do the preparation work, do the promotion afterwards. They can do that too. So, you know, for a business owner that says I can spend, you know, two hours a week on this, we're like, great, you know, we can get you on two to three podcasts in that time. And that's reaching a whole lot of people uh, in those podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. I love that. So let's talk a little bit about more uh, where everyone can find out everything they need to know about Tom Schwab and, uh, and how to connect with you. So I, we already know tmschwab.com. Is there anything else they need to know? Oh, um, wait a minute. Slash Vroom, right? Slash Vroom and everything that uh, Jeff and I talked about will be there. Um, there's, you know, the, the secrets to getting booked on a podcast. There's a little 30-minute training video there that'll tell you exactly, you know, the steps to, to grow your business as a podcast guest. Um, also have the, the interview valet, which is the concierge level done for you service there. And I always say that my favorite social media platform is LinkedIn. Okay. Um, I have met so many amazing people there. Um, and I am the only Tom Schwab in Kalamazoo. So if you, if you search for me, you will find me easily. Tom Schwab, Kalamazoo. That, that's that's pretty good because Tom Schwab by itself, people might think you're you're related to Charles. Well, you know, I in the military, people used to ask that. They'd say, any relation to Charles Schwab? Right. And I'd say, yeah, he's my dad, uh-huh. which is true. Which is true. It's just not the Tom Schwab. It's not the, the Charles Schwab. Tra- Charles Schwab. Well, but right. I was really honest and I'd, I'd say, yeah, give me money and I'll give you a 50% return. And they'd say, well, how can you promise that? And I'm like, self-restraint. I'll only blow half of the money and I'll return the other half. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. I was like, <laughs> nobody, t- t- nobody took me up on that. Yeah. Nobody wants a 50% return. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a blast. Thank you so much for uh, spending your time with me and, uh, and giving me a lot of things to think about. I think that's going to be my new strategy is, uh, is being on other podcasts. I've been on a handful 
of other podcasts, but uh, now I'm I'm thinking I need to add that to my my podcast growth strategy. Well, I think there's only you know the the fact is is that your future customers are listening to podcasts, or they will right. be listening to podcasts. Right. Right, right. The only question is, are they going to hear you? or your competitor on the podcast. And that's something that only you can decide. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Tom. This has been a blast. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Take care. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double E-R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer. Vroom Vroom Veer.